Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Navneet Eshwaran. I'm with Texas Instruments. My co-author is Professor Weigel. So we are here to talk about analog mixed signal, our integrated circuits for automotive applications and some testing methodologies to improve quality of the device. So the content basically uh, is to start with gate drivers, the gate drivers and the power supply unit pin level fault tests, after which I will introduce some reliability topics related to electrical and thermal uh, the thermal impact on the design. Then I will talk about some on-chip parasitic bipolar transistors, and then I will conclude my presentation. Gate drivers. So power semiconductors have accelerated the increase of electronic content in vehicles. And if you look into all the components, especially the power side, it's always dominated by gate drivers. So if you take a transceiver or a solenoid or a valve driver, LED driver, DC-DC converters, everything talks about a control on the gate of a power fit and how you control the loop or the gate is basically is what is differentiating a LED driver versus a DC-DC converter and so on. So we, that's why gate drivers are very important in, in automotive circuits. Okay. And now the state of the art is basically to integrate in especially a large scale integration of power analog and digital circuitry on a single chip. So what are the examples? So for example, you have airbag squib drivers, the braking valve driver, power steering ICs, motor driver ICs. So one commonality, if you, what you will see across all these devices is that they are 40 volt to 60 volt tolerant pins. Even though it's typically a battery, which is 14 volt, I mean, the apps max on the pins is about 40 volt. In some cases, it's about 60 volt based on the application. And motor drivers also demand a negative uh, tolerance or negative voltage tolerance. That is, uh, the chip substrate can be zero but the pin can be taken towards minus 18 volt, or uh, so in some cases it's about minus three, minus four volts and so on. So by 2030, what is expected is that 50% of the cost of the car would be really due to its electronic content. That's the trend we are seeing today. So gate driver is, as I mentioned, it's a pretty common circuit. And what it does is converting a high current Basically, it's a digital to a current converter. So when the digital signal is one, you get some current, which is demanded by the load. When the digital signal is zero, basically the current output is zero. This is very, very simple definition, but in automotive and safety applications, what is very important is the switch that you see here, which is controlled by a driver, it, it cannot turn on by itself and it cannot turn off by itself. You have to really have the control signal to do it. But if by applying a voltage on the, let's say if you use a FET, which is typically a MOSFET, if you apply a voltage on its drain, the source voltage cannot come up. And let's see there are multiple conditions that can cause it. We'll discuss that in the coming slides. And all these are basically RLC circuits, and these outputs can get shorted to ground or to battery, so you have to have current to Next, the temperature and reliability and the load conditions, as I mentioned. So the TJ rise, which is the junction temperature across the pet or the power transistor, that can go pretty high. For DC conditions, like so you have LDOs that are permanently turned on, the, you make sure that the temperature rise within the pet, uh, you know, is always less than 175 degrees. So it's not a limitation of the Fed, but it's all limitation of the solderability, then the mold compound, you know, temp, you know, those are setting the limits. But in some cases, it can be uh, higher, you can allow higher temperature, especially for temp, uh, time periods where the package intervention is pretty low, which is like three milliseconds, for example. And I'll show you some cases like airbag application. So there you can even push it to much, much higher temperature as long as you are able to control the turn off of the effects. From an electrical reliability standpoint, you have to make sure that you are not exceeding the ratings of these effects. Okay? 
VGS, VDS, VSB rating, the source to bulk rating of the slides. So operating within the temperature range that is recommended for the FET and also by its electrical conditions, these are called as the electrical or thermal safe operating areas. And most of the gate drivers today always operate in a multiple supply voltage environment, meaning the drain of the FET could be at the could be controlled by the battery voltage. Then the gate driver could be coming out from a bootstrap or a or a separate charge pump to, to basically provide a higher gate drive so that the drain voltage equals the source voltage. And the digital signal is a 1.8 volt rail. All this can be completely different power supply domains. So under any missing supply or a supply fault condition, there should be no inadvertent activation or deactivation of the power pipe to the power stages. And the load condition, what we are talking about is typically in the range of one micro Henry to three milli Henry. This is for solenoids. Of course, and your current limits, we try to make it as stable as possible for all these inductive loads. So that because it's a very critical based on the application, it's very critical to have it stable or sometimes small signal oscillations are allowed, but but not. But you have to really make sure it's pretty stable, meaning that you have a good face margin for those loads. Okay. Let's uh, talk about the gate driver and the power supply. So as I mentioned, so the LD MOS typically is used as the power fed because of its power density. You know, it can have a large VDS on a smaller area. So, so that's basically why LDMOS is always the preferred choice in the industry for, uh, for power FETs. Of course, these days it's more, uh, again, the LM nitride transistors are coming for high voltage applications like 400 volts. But for the silicon 40 volt integrated circuits, it's, it's still LDMOS, okay? So the LDMOS transistors are very common. So the gate has to be higher than these are. It has to handle the inductive loads without any external freewheeling pack. That's very important for gate drivers. You know, if you have multiple gate drivers in a single chip, so all the for all those pins, you know, uh, that are going out, you know, you don't want to have a short key diode to provide the freewheeling motor. It's really from a cost perspective. Uh, it's recommended to find out a way to provide the Inter freewheeling current internally. So they have to withstand a single fault, but multiple times. So if you have a high side driver, you could have a short to ground at the output. If you have a low side driver, you could have a short to battery. So they have to really withstand those. And here is a simple cross section of the LD MOS. So what you have is basically a substrate. Typically it's a P-type substrate. Then you have the buried layer. And then you have the special P well so that the source can be isolated from the substrate. So you have to watch out for this P and P current, you know, in case you forward by steel junction to make sure it's not resulting in any catastrophic damage. You don't want too much current to go through, you know, to, to avoid any damage on the chip. Okay. From a power supply unit, typically from a power management ASIC, so you have a battery coming in. Then you have multiple converters, a boost, buck, and the linear regulator. The boost converter is basically to generate a high voltage, so which is typical, or you can use a charge pump in some cases, the current is low. So that output range could be 22, but most cases what I've seen, especially airbag or some braking ICs, they go up to 33 to 38 volts. And these are supplying most of the high side drivers and some of the diagnostic circuits and ICs. Then either you do a buck converter from VBAT or the boost output is basically, you know, uh, going and uh, some, as the input to the buck converter to generate about six volts or five volts in some cases. And the LDO basically to generate, to supply a 3.3 volt rail to some of the sensors or the, sometimes it is directly used by our digital core or diode box. So gate driver and the power transistor. So you have a gate driver like a LD MOS. So the gate basically has to be, let's say five volts or, ha or higher than the source so that you get much lower drop and then the source voltage will be equal to the drain voltage or, uh, or like minus the load times RDS on, which is what we need. And uh, if in some cases you may not be able to afford a charge pump or a boost converter so if you are 
limited your choice is just to integrate one switch like this typically people also choose a pmos so here drain voltage is maybe bat minus i load times rds on the power transistor so the only thing is the pmos transistor is about 3x larger than the nmos so you need to just watch out for your choice whether you want to go with a charge pump plus several ldmos based power transistors or you will just go with a, a simple gate driver with the PMOS, uh, you know, so it's all area trade off uh, and, and, and number of pins that you can utilize for the charge pump and so on. It's, it's basically a simple trade off that needs to be done from a system level and you make the choice out of it. So here is a low side topology. So in low side topology, okay, you have the a converter in picture. So the gate driver needs to be just five volts. Or it's in some technologies it is 12 so it's just like it's a low voltage uh, gate oxide that is uh, so you need a low voltage supply to drive the gate so the drain basically is the battery through the load or in some cases uh, there is also a blocking diode to support uh, some minus uh, let's say less than minus one, one volt applications so in some case if it's a mi minus 18 volt is in motor driver so of course then yeah, yeah it's a blocking diode in order to protect this junction from getting exposed. Okay. So what kind of applications do we use? So you use, uh, for example, an LED driver. So this is a high side switch driving the LED. So here, this is a low side configuration. So in both cases, it's where what you see is a very common specification related to the max load current and related to the current limit, related to the slow rate. Okay. Some customers go and ask us to configure that either high side mode or in the low side mode. So you need a floating driver. So which basically shows here what you've shown is a FET. It's drain source. It can configure in any direction, meaning you can tie this to battery and through the load, you can pull it to ground or you can keep this at ground or through the load connected to the battery. So either high side or low side, but the specification is the same. So you have slew rate control. Of course, then you have current sense to do a current limit. And, and basically you have to make sure that the FET is able to provide the max, sized enough to provide the maximum current that you need. So this is what is a configurable high side or low side driver. Okay. So the same thing, as I told you, in automotive, it's, it's typically about gate drivers, right? So here in gate drivers, this is a control loop for voltage regulation, right? So you're still having a high side driver. You can either do it from a charge pump or you can use a bootstrap to do that. Then you have an asynchronous configuration where you have the freewheeling diode and so on. Okay. So this is a asynchronous buck with charge pump. This is a synchronous buck with charge pump. This is with bootstrap and similarly a synchronous buck with bootstrap. The only difference is now this is going in a closed loop in order to regulate the voltage, but otherwise there is no big difference for you between a LED driver or a, or a buck power stage in an open loop configuration. So in some cases, when you go into some safety applications, the bootstrap is not really preferred because you need to do some diagnostics to know if the cap is present or not. So that is why some customers directly demand a PMOS based switch and uh, do a synchronous buck or a synchronous buck. So that, that's the choice, the system level choice, safety requirements, all this are uh, drive this. Okay. Similarly, you talk about LDOs, it's again a gate driver, but it's in a closed loop in a linear fashion regulating the output voltage. So this is high dropout case. This is a low dropout NMOS LDO. This is a PMOS LDO. So at the end of the day, it's all about gate drivers. Either you keep it in open loop or you do it in closed loop and achieve certain voltage regulation or current regulation. Similar concept for a current regulator. So this is basically a kind of a control loop which is regulating the current uh, through this FET. So you're just using a metal resistor 
to in order to sense the voltage uh, across, like when current flows of course you're sensing the voltage drop and then you're regulating it through a reference this is the equation assuming low offset of the OTA and same thing with the sense fed you can also do a current regulation this is a kind of low side topology and so based on the magnitude of the current you can decide either to go with a sense fed or put a metal resistor or think about even sensing directly the VDS of the offset and regulating the current no matter which architecture or which topology the the architecture of the ic starts from a pin level fault test okay? so what it means if you have an ic like this and let's say you have a pin which is a 5 volt regulator so the what kind of architecture do you need to choose for your ldo for example depends on what kind of shots this pin will get exposed okay right so what do you typically do in a case in case of a regulator output so the output can get shorted to ground i mean so you have to put a current limit so you're testing your dc accuracy you're checking your line and regulation for mean and max load currents but at, at the end of the day in automotive you have to go one step higher to check for the, to guarantee the quality of the device in the application for a long term and that is why you know so the short to ground fault a single point fault is always common in automotive so you have to short when, when the short happens on the regulator output you have to limit the current okay so there are multiple ways we can leave it just limit the current and be happy with it but at the same time if that happens for a very long duration from a feedback condition of 28 volts for example right so you're going to have a lot of power dissipated across the fed and that's not good because your junction temperature can rise significantly and lead to some catastrophic failures in the system so you need to always see take some additional steps to mitigate the risk okay so one thought was what if we sense the load current and uh, compare it with a threshold and if it exceeds the threshold let the over current detector turn off the ldo after a few milliseconds and let us continue okay so that was working fine until at one point the customers said okay what if i go lower in the threshold okay when you go lower in the threshold so that means this over current detector will still not turn off the ldo so then arise uh, you know arouse a need for thermal protection so you are backing up your designs with several techniques to mitigate the risk in case of in case one failures and that's where one fails that's basically the design fme concept so if if there happens a failure in the design what is the way to mitigate it okay so these are typically how you would make sure that your circuit is robust across some of the fault conditions that will happen in the automotive especially for single fault conditions then let's now take a look into the buck boost converters or a buck converter so in the buck converter power stage so the lx pin is your switching node where the coil is connected okay. so typically what happens is the customers wanted to want to check if the, there is visible intervention of the current limit so they even sometimes take the coil out take the switching node put this regulator in in a kind of uh you know so you are trying to see if you put in a condition where the regulator can go in the max duty cycle so and then they're looking into when they short it they, they don't short it directly to you know with a zero ohm there's no possibility to do that but they will go in steps to see whether the current limit kicks in so the short to ground they close the switch change this resistance go from a high ohmic value to a low ohmic a few ohms and then see if you have visible intervention of current limit to turn off the regulator the same thing happens for short to battery so they have expect a current limit to protect the low side fed in case you have a short to battery so in the buck boost it's even complicated because typically what happens in buck boost you know where you make the current sense so if you do some average current current mode or whatever it's more than sufficient to sense the current across this boost fed boost high side and of course for the reverse current you do let's say current sense on the low side now if you remove the coil and then place the loop and then uh, in already kind of wire buck mode and especially in the longer duty cycle so then you when you do this test if you don't have current limit you're going to 
you know, damage the spec. So we have to then implement current limitation on both the feds to make sure that this particular power stage on the buck side is uh, is robust to the faults, short to battery or short to ground. If the go side is taken here, we have implemented current sensing, and when you hit those limits, current limits, you will turn off the fed. But in the buck side, if you don't implement, and if you go with such a test condition, this, there are possibilities to damage the fed. So I have to be very, very careful in considering this from the beginning and then implement this in order to protect your device even though they can live without it for a bug boost type of converter yeah from electrical reliability let's take a closer look and what all the key requirements so protection strategy is the key for each transistor to get its uh, to make it electrically reliable which means you have to operate it within its safe operating area electrical safe operating area no matter what current it is so you have to operate each transistor within its vds vgs and vsb ratings so in gate drivers or in any ic that has multiple supply environment make sure that there are no floating nodes in the design and there are no ways to inadvertently turn on or turn off transistors due to wrong level shifter outputs okay. current limit loop should be stable proper freewheeling flow for inductive loads. Otherwise, you'll have too much VDS across the feds. So in high side, the voltage could go negative without the freewheeling diode or a freewheeling path. In the high side, in the low side driver, especially when you have a coil and you suddenly turn off the fed, the drain kick, voltage can go high and you want to make sure that, you know, the freewheeling path is provided. Otherwise, you again violate your electrical and thermal SYA possibly in those conditions and damage the feds. From metals, you have to really make sure that there's no electro migration issues. You have to really, really have good layout of the metals, especially these are very high currents, and you have to make sure that this does not, uh, you know, push the damage from a single point defective collateral to much more, it will expand into much additional, damaging additional circuits nearby in the vicinity of the device. So you have to, so that means what? You have a power fed, let's say you have not routed well, so uh, let's say the metallization is weaker, so you basically you, when you push high current, the metal will start to melt and start to, it's, it's a liquid, becomes a liquid, it starts to flow, it could have a reflow, and potentially short to a neighboring line, that could be another high voltage line, so eventually it could come damage additional circuitry that is next to your effects. So this is what we wanted to avoid, okay? So, so you have to take care of electro migration issues, like in any other design. So what are the protection schemes? So your choice of your FED is based on your apps max. If it is a 40 volt pin, go with 40 volt FEDs. Unless you have a much lower FED that can withstand, let's say 40 volt for several seconds in the application. So you don't need to be operating for years at 40 volts, but you could have load dump situation where you might have to withstand those 40 volts for a few hundreds of milliseconds. Okay. So that's why the recommendation is to start with a 40 volt fed or a higher. Okay, so most of the technologies we have today are asymmetric, right? So the gate to source junction is a lower voltage, low lower voltage uh, rated, uh, and then the gate to drain is high voltage rated. So in those situations, make sure that you have protection clamps, and then in order to avoid any inadvertent turn on of the feds, especially at power up. You try to add circuit like resistors between gate and source, uh, whether it is an NMOS or a PMOS. The other ways to do it, but the simplest way is to keep a passive element that keeps the gate and source tracked to each other when it is in the off state. So none, none of the spikes or whatever you know coupled to the gate. So and then turn on the fan. So if even if it you know so you want to keep them going with each other so that the VGS is always less than the VT. So that's basically the idea. Okay. So from an electrical reliability standpoint, so you want to, all, as I told you, always make sure you have protection clamps, for example. So here I have a resistor, but at the same time, we recommend to add Zener diodes to protect the gate source junction, you know, to be always less than five volts or something. And there will be circuits, let's say, in the diff pair where there can be conditions where your uh, differential pair can see higher delta V. So in those kind of in 
cases try to have additional clamps in place. So for example, if you have a sense pet and you have the drain of those pets at different voltages, so you could have hot carrier injection as well. So in this case, let's say you have another case, the drain is tied uh, to the BZX, whereas the source is at a different voltage with respect to ZX. So you could potentially have uh, you know, hot carrier injection, uh, or if it is a diffamp, it can be an NBTI or PBTI. So use the clamps in a selective way, you know, to so that to minimize these effects. Okay. Let's come to this level shifters. In a multiple supply voltage environment, as I told you, you have you got to be really, really careful in using these kind of level shifters. Anything without a fail-safe protection is very risky. So what it means is in a multiple supply voltage environment, typically the first to come up is the battery followed by the high voltage. Let's say a boost converter, it powers up from the battery voltage, and then it boosts to a high voltage level 22 or 32 volt. But depending on your power supply ASIC, there is always a certain delay for the next rail to come up. It can be one millisecond, it can be 20 millisecond, nobody knows how each power management AC will behave. But you have your gate driver, you have to expect this kind of fault scenarios, okay? In that scenario, what you have to make sure is under the condition when the low voltage rail is zero or is floating and your MV rail is present, you cannot turn on a simple level shifter. The level shifter output cannot go in the wrong direction. So for example, if LB rail is zero, so what will happen is this can go up to A underscore MB, both can be at MB rail, you don't know. So let's say you're using a low voltage, a low side driver, and you're driving this with A underscore MB, what's going to happen? So if A, A underscore LB is zero, which means my gate driver should be is to be turned off, but because of the wrong level shifter output, you know, so basically I'm going to turn on my switch, and that's not correct. And that's very risky, especially in safety applications like airbag. It will deploy the airbag inadvertently and we cannot allow those. It's a safety violation, okay? So how do you test it? That's very important. So you can simulate, uh, you know, whatever it is, but then, you know, but the best way to do it, as we have seen, is do some ramp like this to the first, the high voltage then you have the ramp, the MB signal, and then the low voltage signal. So only when this particular control signal comes out, you want to make sure that your low side driver is turning on only during the ramp. So this is an example of a current regulation of the low side driver. So this is the way to test it. And also even simulate it at IC level. You have to really allow, it takes simulation time, that's clear, but, but you have to really, really make sure that across all scenarios, your level shifters are really, really giving the correct output. They are not going crazy and pushing the effect. The problem with the level shifter can create much more troubles uh, for the power stages. So we have to be very careful in designing those. Okay, similar requirement for the LDOs. So the LDOs are always, uh, you know, could be a single rail or it could be multiple rails. So meaning your error amp can be supplied with a, with a low voltage rail, and here it can be a high voltage rail. So when the VREF is not available, there is no MV rail available. So it's common that you know the, the voltages can go up. Okay. So you need to have, so let's say if you have a current source, what happens, right? So and then the current source is generated only when the MV rail comes. Obviously you have a floating condition. So which means you could potentially turn on your transistor in such a way that this voltage can be at the battery voltage. So imagine if VO is a low voltage output and you're supplying a digital circuitry there, right? What's going to happen? You're going to put your battery voltage on your digital circuit, which is going to, which is going to uh, destroy your digital completely because it, so if it's a 1.8 volt digital, it cannot really take more than two volts. And if you are putting 18 volt, it's the part will get fried immediately. So it's very important to control this sequence. Take you know have proper sequence at power up, or make sure that you know, if you are directly driving those with level shifters, they, those level shifters have to be really really controlled. You have to have a fail safe operation in those level shifters. Okay. Okay. Thermal reliability. 
as I told you, you know, there are some applications where your fets are sized in such a way, uh, you know, with a operating certain operating condition, right? So you have to really make sure, uh, you know, when the power dissipation is way too high. For example, this is an airbag deployment driver. So I have the same current regulator here. And then you know, what I've shown you previously, but if I take this VZX to 38 volt, as I told you, it can be 22, sometimes it can be 38 based on the application. You are, you know, burning about 49 watts of power, which is about 98 millijoule of energy. Okay, so it's very important to make sure that under those conditions, so it's only operating for two milliseconds. Okay, so the package does not come into picture, but you have to really make sure that when the temperature keeps increasing at those conditions to 400 degrees, your FET has to be really, really turning off at the end of the pulse. Okay, but um, how do you know? How do you know the temperature at which it is able to switch off, right? So the thermal simulations will tell you, you know, that okay, your junction temperature will be around 468 degrees. Then your technology team comes into picture to make sure that they are giving you a number called the critical temperature. And above that critical temperature, you really don't want to operate your FETs. You really want to operate your FETs below that temperature. And the way to do that is basically explained in this paper by Phil Howard. So where you are basically fixing your VGS and then you are increasing your VDS. Okay? Or you can also do the other way around. Fix your VDS, keep increasing your VDS. And then you're looking at your resistance, which is a function of the aspect ratio of the FETs under pulse time. Okay. So this is called the time-dependent thermal resistance. You know, this is basically you are arriving at a number, you are you're calculating this, and then the junction temperature rise is basically the ambient plus this power dissipation, the VDS ID times RTH. So that's basically what is helping to calculate the junction temperature rise. So if you are, uh, and then if your critical temperature is the point at which the DMOS completely fails, in, that means that the FET blows up with the source and range shorted. Okay, so this is basically a technology number and it varies from supplier to supplier. So what we have to do is basically have this secret known before from your technology team and then with thermal simulations understand what is the junction temperature rise within this FET and then and then size of the FET in such a way that you will never exceed secret. So the message here is you don't need to be overall conservative in dimensioning your FET for very short power dissipation um, conditions. So two millisecond is a short transient, especially in airbag when the next pulse, you know, if you do a PWM immediately, of course, you have to be very conservative, but these are a single pulse followed by the cooling, you know, by a suppression time for at least in the lab, we test it every 500 milliseconds. The next pulse comes over 500 milliseconds. So, under these conditions, make sure that your FET is optimized, but at the same time, not an oversized. Uh, so you can push your temp by a temperature range, the junction temperature at which this FET can operate can be pushed towards t -crit. So you could have about 50 degree margin from your t -crit. If it is 550 degrees for, for this technology, I mean, I'm just placing it at 470 degrees. So that's basically the message from the slide from a thermal reliability standpoint. Always operate within thermal SOA, but see where you can push the limit. You can push it to a certain region for these kind of applications, uh, you know, keep it operating at say, say for, let's say at 100 degree or 50 degree margin from your critical temperature. Okay. And the next thing is, okay, once you have designed the FETs, I mean, the, the automotive applications, they are exposed, all the ICs are exposed to uh, several kinds of tests. Okay, so we saw about short to ground, short to battery, and here is the kind of uh, chattering load. So you have an application like airbag where you have high side FET and low side FET working together in tandem. So then the load is connected between. So all you have to do is basically when the high side is regulating the current, the low side is in RDS zone mode, and then you have to provide a constant pulse. Okay which is about 1.3 amps or 1.4 amps for two milliseconds. But in the order, that would be a very, very normal case of current regulation. If there is a short to ground, of course you survive 
the loop is still regulating, but it's able to withstand that power dissipation and uh, current limit is stable and all. That's all understood. Okay? In automotive, we take, go one step more in making the path of high quality and robustness. What happens is they suddenly they introduce a shot. So it's already a shorter pulse of two milliseconds. On top of that, the low side driver can be shorted to battery immediately. You know, like within 500 microseconds, they shot it. And then after 500 microseconds, they even remove this shot and to see if the current limit is still regulated by the high side. So here you have a three amp current limit from the low side. And when the shot to battery condition is removed, the low high side driver should still start regulating the current. Why they do this? Because in the past, they have seen cases where suddenly when these kind of conditions happen, something goes wrong and something has damaged the fit. Nobody knows what was the root cause, but, but, but exactly, but this can happen, you know, these kind of conditions can happen in the cars. And that is why customers have pushed the quality, you know, the, of the designs, you know, by asking us to design for these kind of um, failure cases. So uh, this is valid case, a failure case, valid case, failure case. And this again repeats after one second. So the part has to still work. And these are additional measurements I'm showing you for a, a configurable driver, you know, that can do a solenoid. In solenoid, you have to make sure the freewheeling is still working because the so inductive load is pretty harsh. So, but while happening, you know, this is basically the free, the high side itself is conducting the current. So when that happens, you know, so the voltage goes to minus two and then recovers towards zero. So in those situations, you have to really make sure that the FET is still uh, thermally robust because I'm still passing the current through the FET, even though my output of the, the gate is closely going towards zero, but still because of the freewheeling within the FET. So it's uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, we have to make sure that there is no thermal violation or destruction of the FET during the freewheeling, okay? So these are examples of uh, uh, the 100 micro Henry case and uh, Three million. So you can see that we are testing it for a wide inductive range in some cases. Okay. So highly integrated gate drivers and active discharge. So 20 years ago, what was happening in the automotive world is every IC was separate. So meaning a power supply was separate, a squib driver was separate, you know, so a CAN network was separate and so on. But now what has come is like people, the integration has been matured that you know you could integrate several uh, devices, uh, several uh, circuits, uh, power supply unit, uh, squib drive, gate drivers, transceivers, a LIN transceiver, CAN transceiver, everything on a single chip. Okay? So there's always a microcontroller, there's an additional chip. So the integration has started to increase in cars, as I told you. And by the one way is to have system basis chips where you put even more functionality on a smaller area, on a cert certain area. When this happens, of course, you have to have, worry about power dissipation, package limitation. The additional considerations that have to be given is the cross crosstalk or noise, EMI, then the electromagnetic interference, right? The, the, the uh, slew rate control to avoid any radiation of noise to the system. Then, because you have to test for all this, it takes a longer time to release the product to the market. So easily it can take four years to release a chip of this quality of this quality. You know. So it also then challenges the defect density because once you start to manufacture, the larger the die, you know, you can always have more defects. So you have to always weed out, filter out those defects before shipping it to the field. So the zero DPPM strategy is becoming very, very challenging. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the active discharge. So in some cases, what can happen, your load is at ground and you could have a sudden shot to battery on this side, okay? Or if you have two channels like this in a, in a single chip, so one channel could be shorted to ground and the other channel, you know, when you have, let's say the ZX pin and the other channels are shorted to battery, a very, very fast transient, then what happens, you know, like you have multiple drivers connected together, so, so the source, uh, short to battery on the source of one channel can appear as 
a voltage spike on the drain of the other channel because there is a body diode. Right? Imagine that you are having a replica of this and then you are shorting Z1 up very fast. So the drain of the FET goes up and then this is basically showing that VZX, it will appear like a VZX spike. And since the other channel has a path to ground, so you will have to control that current because in the unpowered state, there is no pull down. I don't have any pull down. Okay, the resistor will help to quickly bring the, to, to bring down the, to, to make the source catch the gate and then discharge the current back to zero. But if, if it is not fast because of the RC net field, uh, time constant, you have to have additional design techniques like a switch, you know, that senses the spike and then shorts this resistor to discharge this gate even quickly. That's basically what is called the active discharge and the, the resistor is called the passive discharge. The customers love to have resistors between the gate and source of the pit. These are some examples. So if you have a very fast transient on the drain of the high side, so this is basically you know, how it discharges quickly. So similar results for the low side driver as well. So what I've shown you in the paper. So those low side and high side drivers have individual uh, switches to discharge this gate very quickly in case of a power event. Okay. So on-chip parasitic bipolars, it's very, very important because the moment you go into multiple uh, integrate start when you start to integrate more circuits on a single chip. What happens is this could be one channel. All, all I want is the current IB. For example, when I turn on the switch GS1, all I want is take this current down to you know to INP node. Because when this is off, there is no issue. Then you basically the current goes here and drops across the resistor. Now there is a neighboring channel. If you take this channel to let's say minus 0.7 minus 2 is a bit too aggressive but let's say minus uh, 2 volt or like minus 1 volt for example so it could be even turning on this fed so that all the current will go here and come back to the switch the other thing is when you are at minus 0.7 if it is a very very small current right so then the current could even simply go through the parasitic npm and you will not have any uh, voltage at the INP node. So that's basically a cross-link failure and this could be a system level issue that you need to address with proper layout for which you need to have guardrails. So when you have one drain, you know, and then the other drain getting towards minus 0.7 and if they are very, very close based on your technology, the, spa the spacing, is at the, the activation of the NPN can be stronger. So when they are very, very close, of course, it's very strong. So the way to fix it is basically have additional guard rings to ground or to supply and then basically provide, you know, say you are protecting this drain from leaking the current into the aggressor. So you have to have a guard ring strategy or sometimes you can use deep trench in some, uh, uh, you know, in order to mitigate this NPM. Okay. So the same, now when you have a highly integrated circuit like this with such a floor plan, the analog core can be sitting way, you know, uh, let's say uh, the larger separation from, from some of your gate drivers. But then if you are operating with much lower currents in a few nano, hundreds of nanoamps or one microamp, so what can happen when some of the gate voltage, the, the voltage on the drivers, if they get exposed to minus 0.7, it's easy that this parasitic NPN can be strong enough to uh, limit your band gap voltage or even completely pull it down. So that could be maximum parasitic activation on highly integrated circuits. So I have to really, really protect them with uh, layout strategies and prevent any failure at system level. With this, I'm concluding my presentation. So the gate drivers are one of the key elements for electronic growth in automotive. So the protection against pin faults is mandatory, as I told you. So several testing methods were covered here. The protection clamps help from the electrical and thermal reliability of the gate drivers. Floating nodes are very catastrophic because they can lead to much more severe issues in the system. So you need to mitigate them with simple and novel architectural changes in the level shifters or any other way in the power stages to avoid those floating nodes. The parasitic bipolar transistors create serious issues and we really have to have smart layout techniques to mitigate those risks. So with this, 
here are a few references and i thank you for your attention i'm ready to take questions thank you